So beginning chapter one uh, with something completely different in a field of math that we would probably call um, best as discrete math. So we've got kind of a new set of topics from our normal, what would be more pre-calculus topics, I guess, that we've talked about so far this year. I'm talking about sequences, series, and eventually in this chapter, proof. Uh, but we're going to start at the beginning with just kind of getting used to notation um, for sequences and series. So a sequence is a list of numbers written in a defined order following a specific rule. Every entry in the sequence is called a term, and sequences may be finite or infinite. So maybe I have some kind of a sequence, and it's just two, I don't know, four, six, eight, ten, we keep it easy, right? Well, we can assign a number to each of those terms, right? We call it just the term number, and our book tends to use R for that in, in this chapter. So our first term is two, and our second term, maybe I'll use a different color here. Our first term is two, and our second term is four, three, four, five, right? Well, if we were to continue out this sequence to have what we would call an infinite sequence, right? If I didn't continue it out, we would have a finite sequence. Well, if I were to continue this out, we have some kind of a rule, right, that created our sequence, and it's taking the term number and doubling it every time, in this case. Right, the first term, we multiply it, we take number one, we multiply it by two, we get two. We take two, double it, get four, three, six, four, eight, and so on. So, this is kind of what we're dealing with with the sequence. It's just a list of these numbers. We always have some kind of a general term, and that would be what this UR is. This is our general term. Although I know a lot of times I've seen A sub R, and you might see me use both. Um, I'm trying to be better with using the book's notation just to get you used to what you're gonna see in the book, but um, I know I'm used to seeing A sub R a little more often. Uh, and this comes with the catch that r has to be a positive integer. That just means that r is going to be greater than or equal to 1 and also an integer. So that general term is going to define the way we create the sequence. I'm just going to move this out of the way. So if I've got something like 3r minus 1, and I just tell you that r is a positive integer, well, this is going to be an infinite sequence and it's just going to continue on, right? If I plug 1 into this, I'm going to get 2. If I plug in 2, I get 5, and I'm just going to add 3. Every time, 11, 14, and so on. Well, down here, I've got a finite sequence. And I tell you that I'm only going to go up to 5, right? As long as my term, my counter, is less than or equal to 5. So that would just be 2, 5, 8, 11, 14. The very subtle difference and the only thing that distinguishes a finite sequence from an infinite sequence is this ellipsis right here. And that's really the only thing that tells us that my sequence continues on infinitely. So for example, write each of the following sequences using the general term. We kind of have to work backwards here. And the way I like to do this, especially while we haven't really learned any shortcuts yet, is to make a table. So when r is 1, in this case, we've got 3. And when r is 2, 6, 3, 9, 4, 12. And we kind of want to reverse engineer a function that allows us to produce 3, 6, 9, and 12 from 1, 2, 3, and 4. And this one's pretty straightforward because we notice that to get from term to term, well, we're adding 3 every time. Um, but even more simply, we get this just by multiplying our term number by 3. So if I were to extend this just in general, my general term is 3r. So this would be 3r. And we just want to state that r is a positive integer. This is an infinite sequence, so we don't need any sort of limitation on r like we did earlier. Uh, in B, we notice that we have a finite sequence, first of all. We'll come back to that later. And again, we want to come up with some kind of a rule. So let's make our chart again. 
and it'll be three or five terms. 2, 7, 12, 17, 12. Well, there's no immediate connection that'll get us from 1 to 2, 2 to 7, 3 to 12, and so on. But maybe we notice that between each of these, we're adding 5 every time we go from term to term. So let's try to work this out a little bit. If I want to talk in general, well, let's see here. We're starting at 2. And we're adding some number of 5, some multiple of 5. Well, how do we figure out how many 5s we're adding? Well, we notice that when I'm at term number 2, I'm, I've added 5 once. When I'm at term number 3, I've added 5 twice. 4, 3 times, and so on. So we notice that we're adding one less 5, one fewer 5, than the number of term I'm on. So the way we're gonna do this to kind of account for it is to say r minus one, right? There's one less five that we've added than the number of the term that I'm on, right? And we can, ch we can check this. If I have, if I'm on term number one, I should just have two, right? So one minus one is zero and I get two. We wanna simplify this, so we're gonna get, let's see, two plus five r minus five and I get five r minus three. So my general term is 5r minus 3. r is a positive integer, but this is also a finite sequence, so I need to state how many terms I have. I need my counter to stop at 5, so we're going to say r less than or equal to 5. And of course, this last example, this one's actually kind of fun, just because it's a little bit different. Um, we need a connection, again, between r and our term. And again, there's no immediate connection, but like function that'll take us from R to U sub R here. Like, like, I mean immediate as in what we came up with in part A. But we do notice something. I'm gonna zoom in so I can maybe mark this up a little bit better. We notice that my R is always represented in the numerator. All right, well, that seems to be important. Um, one thing I like to do if I'm stuck is just kind of isolate the numerator and denominator. So let's actually do that. I'm gonna just gonna call it n and b. So if we're stuck with a rational expression, I think it helps more to actually isolate the two um, parts of the fraction in this case. And we notice that my numerator is just gonna be the term number. And now we it's crystal clear that the denominator is just one more than the term number. So my general term is just gonna be r over r plus one for all positive integers r. Again, infinite sequence, so we don't need any sort of stopping point. Now series are gonna be very similar. Um, series are just a sequence, but I'm adding up all the terms. Like sequences, they can be finite or infinite, and we've seen sigma notation before when we learned about um, product and quotient, sorry, product and sum of roots. So let's kind of talk about the anatomy of a sigma notation here. So I have my Greek letter sigma, my summation notation, so this is going to indicate that I'm adding up everything. We have an index, and sometimes you'd see an i instead of an r, but we're trying to be consistent in this section. And then we have our bounds. We have a lower bound, so I'm going to tell you that my counter, my index, is going to start at 1, and it's going to go all the way up to 10, my upper bound. And then here, I'm going to use a different color because there's a lot going on now, is I'm going to call it my function but it's my general term. It's my general term, so if I were to expand this series, oops, well, when r is one, my general term is one, and then two, and then three, and then so on all the way up to 10, and that's gonna equal 55. So, we know how to add these together now. We just, we just add up all the terms. 
and we're going to do the same practice that we just did. We're going to write each of the following series using the general term. If it's finite, find its sum. So let's follow the same process that we just did because we haven't learned any tricks yet to make this process faster, which we'll actually talk about in 1.2. So we don't know any, again, any immediate connection from 1 to 3, 2 to 11, but we notice that we're adding 8 every time we move from term to term. So we can notice this and we can write this out in a general fashion. So we're starting at 3 and we're adding 8 some number of times. How many times are we adding 8? Well, we're adding 8, one again, one fewer time than the number of term we're on, right? At 1, I haven't added 8 at all. At 2, I've added 8 once. At 3, I've added 8 twice. 4, 3 times, 5, 4 times. So there's one fewer 8 than whatever r I'm on. And we can simplify this again. So 8r minus 5. So there's my general term. And if I were to write it like a sequence, I would write it this way. But this is not a sequence. This is a series, so I'm going to use my sigma notation. And we notice that r is going from 1 to 5, because there are 5 terms. And my general term is 8r minus 5. And sometimes you'll see it in parentheses just so we know that the whole thing is being added together. And I can find the sum. I can add all these numbers together. So let's see. I'm going to have 14 plus 19 is 33 plus 37 is 60 plus 35 is 95. And then in part B, well, hmm. This one's an interesting one. And it's actually, I think we might spend some more time talking about it um, if we can because depending on where you stop this series, its sum is going to be different. And you can observe that for yourself later. We have 1, negative 1, 1, 1, negative 1. This is a really strange series, but it still does follow a rule. Um, well, I guess I'm trying to figure out how to do this without giving you the answer right away. Um, hmm. Well, we might notice that all the odd r's give us 1, and all the even uh, uh, r's give us negative 1. So under what conditions am I going to get 1 when I have something that's odd and negative 1 when I have something even? Well, I guess the first thing that comes to mind is this sort of odd and even relationship comes when we talk about powers of negative 1. Except, in this case, this is going to generate negative 1 when r is odd and positive 1 when r is even. So that's backwards. So I wonder if we can offset this. And we can, and it's by something called parity. And it's the fact that we've got an odd, this switch, every consecutive number flips between odd and even. Right, where 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 goes odd, even, odd, even, odd. So I can just maybe set my power back 1, and usually we set it back instead of forward. So this way, I'm going to get positive 1 when r is odd. Right? If I plug in 1, I get 0. Negative 1 to the 0 is positive 1. And negative 1 if r is even. And if I plug in 2, I get negative 1 to the first, which is negative 1, which is exactly what I want. So it seems like my general term, oops, this is not a series, a sequence anymore. It seems like my general term is negative 1 to the r minus 1. And that is an infinite series. So we're going to write it that way. And we're not going to worry about its sum right now. Um, we'll talk more about the sums of infinite series later on in the chapter.